today, we're going to talk about Jesus appearing. We've seen him get persecuted, go into the garden. They came and took him forcibly, how they all fell down at his word. And when they got back up, he said, if you're looking for me, then let these go. These are not the droids you're looking for. Everything's cross-referenced in such a twisted way. And so they take Jesus and they beat him and he has a, he has a trial, multiple trials, which none of them find any guilt in him and they assassinate him. They put him on the cross to be killed. The despair that disciples felt, the hardship that was on the hearts of the women, we got to look at all of that. And it's a very sobering experience and we call it Good Friday because we know what it means to us, but it was a tragedy, it was a Black Friday. And after seeing all of what happened there, for Jesus to come alive, to resurrect on the third day, I'm sure was a shock to a lot of the disciples who just didn't understand what Jesus said all along, that he would be handed over, he would be crucified, and the third day he would rise. The Pharisees got it. That's why they guarded the tomb. But his own disciples didn't get it. And so you can imagine how they were perplexed. So we've been going over the life of Jesus. Last week, we talked about his resurrection. The women came to the tomb and they found it empty. They were there early in the morning. They had brought spices to finish the job that had gotten begun three days before but they had to hustle, get him in, roll the stone so that they could observe the Sabbath. And so they did. And Jesus' body was not there. They see two angels and the angels say, you know, the one that you're looking for isn't here. He's risen like he said, like I told you so, which is always such a refreshing thing to hear from anyone. Like, didn't you know? So they may have felt a little stupid, but it was a good thing. And it's an amazing thing that Jesus rose from the dead exactly when he said he would and exactly the way he said. And no one seemed to anticipate it. The girls didn't have to carry all those spices there because he wasn't there. And they knew the exact right tomb. They didn't go to a wrong tomb. They saw him previously where he was laid. So all of the conspiracy theories that say this really didn't happen isn't true. And so what do they do? They run back and in the middle of running back, they run into Jesus and they fall at his feet and he says, go tell my disciples and Peter. I love how he separates Peter from all the others because Peter has a separate experience with Jesus that the others didn't have. He denies him and he runs out of the court weeping in his hands. So make sure you tell them. And when they spoke to them, they didn't believe a word of what they said. They didn't believe the women. In fact, as you know, women weren't even allowed to be witnesses in court. Their word was not accepted as uh, verifiably true. Wow, no women's slippers among us to cry out. <laughs> but Jesus changes all that, doesn't he? He didn't go to the disciples. He didn't go to Peter first. He went to the women. Why? Because the women were serving. Who were the last people at, at the cross? The women were. Who did Jesus go to first? The women. I just think that's uh, pretty slick. Because he takes the last and makes them first. He takes the first and makes them last. And so we saw that Peter and John, after hearing this news, didn't believe a word of what they said, but they take off and they run to the tomb and they find that it's empty and Jesus isn't there. And John's very careful to let us know that he won the race. He got there first. But he stood outside and he looked in and he wasn't sure what to do. Peter runs up, pushes him out of the way, runs right into the tomb where dead people are, presumably. And there's nothing there. And they see what he was wrapped in just kind of deflated. And they find what was wrapped around his face was folded and put in a place by itself. Not something you do when you're stealing a body. If the Romans came in to take his body, they would just would have picked him up not stripped him naked and folded the face cloth up 
they would have just thrown him over a shoulder and taken him out. So it's very suspicious, but John saw and knew. He knew what had happened. Peter was angry, and he's still wondering who took his body. How, how to desecrate such a person's tomb would be horrible. And then we see Mary Magdalene who comes in after the boys leave. Mary Magdalene shows up, and she's weeping, and she at one point knew that Jesus was risen. She was with the women. She was giving the testimony to the disciples, but when she gets back from the disciples, she now wonders what's going on. And she weeps, and there's an angel that speaks to her and says, why are you weeping? Well, because they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they found him. Wait a minute, didn't I just tell you a little while ago, weren't you there with them, that he's risen, like he said? But she spent time with the disciples, which completely deflated her faith to the point where Jesus comes up behind her and he says, woman, why are, you, why are you weeping? And she tells him the same story, presuming he's the gardener. And he says, Mary. In a way that only Jesus could say Mary. Like he says your name in the way that only he can say your name. And she said, Rabbi, Rabboni, Lord. And, you know, grips him and says, you know, I, I'm never going to let you go ever again. And he says, you got to let me go because I've got things to do, people to see, and places to go. And so she does. The story then goes to two disciples of Jesus on the road to Emmaus this very same day. And it's a seven-mile hike. They're walking on this road, and they're talking about everything about who Jesus was and what they had thought. One guy's name is Cleopas. The other man's name is not mentioned. And they're having a conversation and Jesus kind of pulls up behind him and says, hey, what is this that you're talking about while you walk along and are sad? <laughs> like, why the long face? And they said, well, are you a newcomer here to Jerusalem? We, Jesus of Nazareth, we, he was great in word and deed. And we thought he was a prophet. He was going to release Israel from the, the grip of the Romans. We thought he was going to set us free, but they ended up killing him on a cross. And this is the third day. I love that. And Jesus says, oh, how slow to believe. How slow to heart you are to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then beginning with Moses and the prophets, he goes through the entire scriptures in the Old Testament, testifying of all the things that were written about himself. They get to a place where Jesus keeps going forward as though he was going to continue onward and they say, listen, it's getting late. Why don't you come in and eat with us? And, you know, it's, it's, you shouldn't be out here. And so he says, okay. He goes in and, of course, the tradition is the person who's the guest is the guest of honor. And they sit in a high place and they break the bread, probably saying the Shema. And as they do, their eyes are open and they recognize Jesus. Maybe it was the holes in his hand that initially brought their attention to him. You know how it is to have a conversation with somebody and not make eye contact? And suddenly they made eye contact and it was Jesus and he's gone. They were so fired up, they said, listen, we've got to go back and tell the disciples. We've got to go back and say that we saw him. So they're astonished at all of this. Now, the same guys that wanted him to come in because it was late at night and didn't want him out in the streets are now going to take a seven-mile trip in the dark and they're going to go tell the disciples everything that's going on. It just goes to show safety is only important when it's a priority. When Jesus is the priority, safety suddenly goes by the wayside. And so they run and they tell the disciples, listen, we saw him. He's alive. And he showed himself to Peter. And it's a rather interesting thing. Or to Simon. It's an interesting thing because we don't have that in the scriptures. It may have been that he was the nameless person in the scripture with Cleopas. I don't know, something that you can argue about later. This week, we're going to talk about his appearing finally to the disciples. Beginning in verse 36, it says, Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, which he has a habit of doing, and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. You might know it as a ghost. There are a lot of people that say when Jesus rose, he didn't ri rise bodily. He only rose in spirit. And there are denominations that call themselves Christians who actually believe that. But here, 
He shows us that he has a bodily resurrection, but he just shows up. Doors locked, windows closed. These guys are talking about how they saw Jesus and the disciples are in disbelief still. And Jesus suddenly is there. No open doors, no open windows. How did he get in? It doesn't matter. He popped in. You know, it's an amazing thing. Jesus pops in when you least expect him. Maybe into your life even. Certainly with me. And he says, peace to you. Why do you say that? Because that's what they needed. Because <laughs> they didn't have any of that. And Jesus said it in such a way that I think they accepted it. The same story is given to us by John in chapter 20, beginning in verse 19. It says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut and when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, so we're given some more information here. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. This is John's point of view, of course, and John was glad when he saw the Lord. And he was the one who actually thought, maybe he's been resurrected, like he said. And so he was glad, but we know that the rest of them were pretty afraid and they thought he was a ghost. How is it you get two different stories? Well, you get two different stories, you have two different authors. You have Luke who's gonna take it from one point of view, you've got John who takes it from his own point of view. It's not unusual that the pen in which you write with has certain characteristics and color. And so God, the Holy Spirit, writes these things given by God, inspired by God, and yet the personality of the writers comes through. You can no longer say Luke wrote the book of Luke and John wrote the book of John than you can say a computer wrote a letter. It's the Holy Spirit of God that leads them along. And so we, we understand how that's done. As the disciples were in lockdown mode, anticipating capture and death, they were suddenly aware that Jesus had joined them as they were talking about him. Now, I'm sure none of you know what it's like to be talking about somebody and suddenly they show up. <laughs> hey, blah, 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 blah. And I'm sorry, I heard my name. <laughs> you ever have that happen? I get to do that every once in a while. I sneak up behind people. And I hear my name and I go up and I go, what's that? Oh, oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. And Jesus just shows up. I hope Jesus shows up for you all the time. In the middle of your day and you go, I totally went through X amount of minutes, hours without even thinking about him. And suddenly you realize he's there. Because he is. We understand that there's another episode here that Luke doesn't mention in verse 24 of John chapter uh, 19 to 24. It says, now Thomas called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. And he said to them, unless I see in his hands the prints of the nails, and I put my finger into the print of the nails, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas gets this rap that sticks to him forever. And now we have this term called a doubting Thomas. What a doubting Thomas. Well, he was worse than that. He was an unbeliever. I will not believe, he said himself. And he said some pretty dramatic things. Sticking your finger. I have to stick my finger into his wound and up into his side. I mean, can you imagine? That's pretty dramatic. He made his point. You don't believe. Okay, I get it. You don't have to say all that. And Jesus says, peace to you. I like what Spurgeon writes about this. About the Lord, there where the air and style as one who had peace in himself and loved to communicate it to others. The tone in which he spake, peace, tended to create it. And he was a peacemaker and a peace giver. And by this sign, they were driven to discern their leader. Jesus said, peace be with you in a way that he generated peace, in a way that he gave peace. I love that about Jesus. 
His very presence is peace. And if you remember, he says, you know, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives, do I give unto you. My peace I give unto you. And I love that because we can actually have the peace that Christ gives. And he offers it as he says, peace be with you. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? You see, because Jesus knew what was in their hearts. Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. So Jesus did a show and tell. You remember show and tell when you were a kid? You bring in your favorite toy and, you know, talk about it. Jesus wanted them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt it was him. And they didn't believe it. He had to go to the point where he said, listen, touch me, handle, handle me, put your hands on me, feel this. I just think it's interesting that he says flesh and bone. He doesn't say flesh and blood. Isn't that interesting? Because we have this term flesh and blood. I'm only flesh and blood. Well, Jesus said flesh and bone. Why didn't he say the more familiar flesh and blood? Hmm, it's interesting. We just had communion, right? Yeah, argue about that later. John chapter 20 goes over this and says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, peace to you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Don't you find that curious? I didn't think the spirit of God came until the second chapter of Acts. Something else to argue about. For if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. John tells us that he's giving them authority to make judgments among people. And guess what they need before they can do that? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> before they can go out and do what Jesus has called them to do, they have to have the Spirit that's going to give them uh, wisdom. And of course, we know the second time, uh, this is a very famous painting um, about the second time Jesus shows up, and it happened to be the first day of the week, which is Sunday too, by the way. And Thomas is actually there, and he says, peace be with you. And Thomas gets to uh, check him out up close. And we know that he drops to his knees, and he says, my Lord and my God. And he wasn't saying, oh my God, Jesus. He was, you are my Lord and you are my God. For a Jewish boy to say that, how could we not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ? Just saying. Why does he provide proof? Jesus proves his true identity and physical existence for all those who would be doubters, deceived, or disciples. Jesus offers proof to all categories. And there are those who say Jesus didn't have a bodily resurrection. And yet here he says, handle me, touch me, know that I have flesh and bone. I want you to be sure of this. For anybody that might deceive you and say otherwise, Jesus leaves unmistakable proof that it, yeah, he had a physical resurrection. Why does Jesus have his scars? You know, Jesus could heal, right? Why would he keep the scars? I, I, I pulled this out of a commentary. Because it's the object of eternal amazement to the angels that God would come down into a human form and die for the sins of the world. And it's proof. He's got proof on his hands and his feet. Ornaments, trophies of his great work for us. It's kind of like a scar that we carry. If you've ever been through anything traumatic and you have a scar, you know, or, or you have a wound, I, I still have a, a gaping chunk missing. It's a reminder of what happened. It's an ornament. It's a trophy. And if it's something that you did and, and pushed through, it's something that I think Jesus wears proudly and remember. Memorialize the weapons by which he defeated death. He defeated death by dying himself. 
to serve as advocates in his perpetual intercession for us. The scripture says that Jesus continues to intercede for us. Why would he have to do that? Because we keep messing up. Well, I do. You guys might. You might be okay. I keep messing up, and he perpetually has to say, by the way, I bought this one. This one's mine. He's not perfect, but look, I paid the price for all of his sin. He's mine. She's mine. And to preserve the evidence of humanity's crime against him. You want to you see proof? As Jesus spoke the truth and he did everything right and we put him to death as, as the human race, we all stand guilty as we look. And so it's evidence. It's evidence against the uh, prosecution. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? Really? This big moment, Jesus is showing off his scars and trying to convince them and they don't believe. And he goes, hey, you got something to eat? You got a little Stella Doro, anything you got? And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, which is a strange diet. People that are extreme might say, well, that's a biblical diet. There it is. Jesus ate that. It's random stuff that they had. They were scared to death. They didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Here. And he took it and he ate it in their presence. By the way, almost all of his post-resurrection appearances involve food. I'm comforted by this. Like I'm not, it's not all wrong, you know? Food is good. And Jesus was hungry, which is another thing that tells me he had a physical body. But he had a physical body that could eat food, but he could go through walls. I'm, I'm kind of digging this new body thing. I could do this. Eating together is still a most intimate act of sharing the same experience at the same time. A simple act of sharing a meal together binds us in association with the ones who share it with us. We had a picnic yesterday. That's why I wrote this. We... We all had the same hamburgers, hot dogs, steak, sausage. Well, if you got there early, you got the steak and the sausage. Just, just you know, a little heads up for you. If you come early, you get the good stuff. The good stuff's all out. You come later, you know, the, the flies begin to gather. If we had a longer picnic, the mayonnaise would begin turning, you know. But we, we're all good. We're all good. Sharing a meal together and sharing an experience like that brings us together, doesn't it? I mean, I don't, I don't normally take um, people I hate out to dinner. <laughs> or people that hate me <laughs> out to dinner. It's just, hey, you hate my guts. Let's go have a meal. <laughs> it just does not go together. Because there's something in the act of sitting and sharing. Now, you have to understand the first century. They had bowls and bread, okay? And you would dip your hand into the bowl with the bread. And there's a lot of double dipping going on. And triple dipping. And everybody's part of one another, if you know what I'm talking about. That is the kind of a meal that they understood and they shared. Jesus probably did this alone, though. He sat there and ate while they watched isn't that unnerving? But there's a special intimacy when you share a meal, and I, I think it's important. 1 Corinthians 5.11 even says this, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a, rev a, re a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. It's interesting. Paul writing to the Corinthians say, listen, I, I told you to stay away from, you know, people who are in willful sin. But if, if you did that, you'd have to get out of the world because everybody's a willful sinner, right? But anybody that calls themselves a brother and is living in any one of these categories, somebody who's a schemer, somebody who's an idolater, 
somebody who wants to, you know, rip people off and, you know, an adulterer, somebody who's in adultery, says, with such a person, do not even eat. Isn't that interesting? Do not even eat. Because you have an association with that person. You have an intimacy with that person. So it's just another place to show you that my theory on the food thing is, stands up, I think. And then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Remember just before this, he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, you're not going to understand any of this. It's not going to mean a thing to you. It's like reading somebody else's mail. Because it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 19. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So he quotes Isaiah chapter 14. And he says, God's going to destroy the wisdom and people without the spirit of God are not going to understand a word of what you're going through. You can share the gospel with them and it just sounds like, wah, 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 wah. you know, like Charlie Brown. They're not going to get it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14, it says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. This is mostly to ask, answer the question that Bill asked yesterday at men's breakfast. Can somebody who's an unbeliever believe the scriptures? So there's a, there's a couple answers for you. If you don't understand it, it's going to be foolishness to you. And there's no way that an unspiritual person is going to understand spiritual truth. And aren't you glad that the Lord opened your mind at some point in time? That the Holy Spirit came and helped you to understand what the scriptures mean? What a wonder and a privilege it is for Je <laughs> For Jesus to open our understanding, without that, we would all be lost in our own foolishness. Even my typing suffers. <laughs> but without spiritual wisdom, we're not going to understand anything. And I'm grateful to God for that. And then he said to them, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. <clears throat> Jesus is telling them the gospel that they're going to be telling everyone else. And he's handing it off. 1 Corinthians 15 uh, verses 3 to 6 gives us kind of a succinct version of what the gospel is, the good news that Jesus is saying they're responsible for. For I delivered to you first that which was, uh, that all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. <coughs> of whom the greater part <clears throat> remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. <clears throat> Here's this great first century witness that over 500 people had seen Jesus, that a lot of them were still alive. Some of them had died, but they were still alive. If this is written <clears throat> and it wasn't true, don't you think all kinds of people would come out of the woodwork? Wouldn't you see in the Wall Street Journal, somebody shooting this down or something on the internet? But 1 Corinthians 15 gives us a very definitive answer that Jesus had risen and he was seen over a period of time of 40 days while he stayed with the disciples. And I think that's uh, important. By the way, he says, you, you are witnesses of these things. That word witness is actually the word martyr. <clears throat> so anytime you see the word witness, the Greek interpretation of that is what we call witnesses, but it's martyr. You guys know what a martyr is, right? Martyrs are dead, right? I find it interesting because 
A martyr is those who after his example have poured, proved the strength and genuineness of their faith in Christ by undergoing a violent death. That's what it feels like when you share the gospel sometimes, doesn't it? You are undergoing a violent death, having to share with them the truth that they don't want to hear. Putting yourself out there. Yeah, you're a martyr. You're a witness. Because witnesses are martyrs. And you give your life. And you risk, you know, suffering persecution, people giving you a funny look. That's about all I usually get. I've never been beaten. I've been argued with. But, you know, sticks and stones. But to be a witness is to be a martyr. It means that you sacrifice yourself for someone else. That's what a witness is, and that's what we are. Are you willing to give your life for Jesus Christ? Are you willing to give it by sharing a testimony? That's, sometimes it feels like you're undergoing a violent death. And Jesus says, behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. You guys know what that is, right? That's the Holy Spirit. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed him. What you don't see is there's a timeline in between here. It's not on his initial uh, conversation with them that this happens. In Acts chapter 1, written by the same author, which would be Luke, in verses 3 and 4, it says, To whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, his hands, his side, his feet, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So you see, the book of Acts follows up, and there's a period of time in between his initial appointment with them and later on when he's leaving. And in between that, we know that there are over 500 people that see him during that 40-day period, which is, which is really interesting. And so we now catch Jesus, who's now in Galilee, and he's at the mountain that he told them to be, um, and he's revealing himself to them. And now it came to pass that while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. By the way, the only one that's worthy of worship is God. Another evidence that Jesus is who he said he is. And they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Or given Matthew's take on this. And then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee. So we're told where this happens. To the mountain in which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. Some doubted. Some doubted? Hey, we saw him crucified. He's risen. He's came. He ate some fish. He had, and we've seen him for 40 days. And he now says, meet me in Galilee. There he is. He's having a conversation with us. And they're still doubting. How about you? Every once in a while, you have a doubt? Don't feel bad. You are in really good company. <laughs> and they had more infallible proofs, we're even told. You had the opportunity to stick your finger, you know, like, hey! <laughs> but some doubted. Listen, if a man wrote the Bible, that wouldn't be in it. Amen. If a man wrote the Bible, that wouldn't be in it. Because people look stupid when you put stuff like that. <laughs> some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. That's a good thing to know. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So we get the fuller story here from Matthew as to what Jesus says as he's heading up and as he's out of here. All authority. 
all power and authority has been given unto me. So therefore go. You're going because he sent you with all authority and power. Do you understand that? And he says, go into all the nations and preach the gospel. Make disciples. By the way, this is the charge to all of us as well. You know what a disciple is? A disciplined follower of Jesus Christ. And you know how you do that? Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. That's how you make a disciple. Because sharing a testimony and having somebody give their life to the Lord is only the first step. I would hope and pray that each one of you has somebody that you're responsible for, that you've led to Christ, and you say, Jesus didn't tell me to make converts. He told me to make disciples. How am I making disciples? I'll tell you what, I take this seriously. And if I don't do it, I have no right telling you to do it. But I can tell you, I believe that that is what God has put upon my heart as my own personal mission. Make disciples. You want to be discipled? See me after service. We'll make it happen. We will make it happen. If it kills me. Because I'm a witness. All authority has been given to me under heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples. That's a very direct order, isn't it? Go and make disciples of all nations. No exceptions. Black, white, Latino, Oriental, LGBTQ, I don't care who you are, old, young, make disciples of everybody. There's no differentiation, right? Bikers, drug addicts, violent people, wife beaters, murderers. You guys get it, right? Everybody, everybody. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, which means we're going to be in the word of God. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So don't think I'm sending you on a mission without any power and authority. And don't think that I'm not going to be there with you when you're doing it. It's the Jersey version. It's easy. Go and make disciples. And Jesus blesses them, and he goes up into heaven. And that is the last of the book of Luke. Thought we'd never get there, I know. <laughs> Thinking about all that Jesus went through, and he comes back, and he makes all these assurances that he's there. You know, he's no different today than he has been in the past. If you're unsure as to whether Jesus is in your life or whether Jesus is real, he will show you. He'll show up and say, peace be with you. And he will let you know he is who he is. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal relationship, if you've not received the gift of what he purchased with his very blood, I would love to talk to you about doing that and introduce you to our Savior. So please, it's the biggest decision that anybody can make ever in their life. Amen? Amen? Bigger than getting a dog, buying a car, what you're going to invest in, what game is playing on TV. Listen, the biggest decision that you can make is whether you are accepting of God's provision for your sin, which is the life of God himself, Jesus on the cross. Amen? Amen. So we're done with the book of Luke. <laughs>